It's Talk Funny, a podcast by Mark Bailey and other comics from all over. We ended up in Japan because we like to constantly be told where we cannot stand. The Talk Funny podcast from NagoyaRadio.com and Nagoya Comedy. Here's Mark Bailey. We're back with Talk Funny. I'm Mark Bailey. We're here again with fellow comic Steve Howard. Hello. And in uh, future podcasts, we're going to talk uh, maybe a little bit about your some of the bad experiences you've had with contracts and things yeah. like that. <laughs> but in an earlier podcast, we were talking about when you write things, a lot of us write on notepads mm-hmm. or we use the wave pad or some kind of audio recorder. And I scribbled some things on a piece of paper just so I wouldn't forget them and I was going to put them in my memo pad later and some fellow teacher saw it and goes what's that it looks ridiculous <laughs> i don't get up and do comedy and put it on the powerpoint you know i actually <laughs> these are notes for me to read yeah and i said different songwriters do the same kind of thing i think uh, keith richards hummed something into a tape recorder and right. that became satisfaction <laughs> you know you're no songwriter you're, i mean you're not like a genius like paul mccartney and i'm like okay maybe that was a bad example for yeah. you to pick paul mccartney because now i'm not going to let you get away with that oh the great paul mccartney you mean the genius paul mccartney who once said na 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 hey jude 17 times that genius or i saw her standing she was just 17 if you know what i mean yeah and um um, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was written mostly under the influence of which substances? <laughs> and, and after listening to the Beats Boys' Pet Sounds, how do you get that album out of Pet Sounds? <laughs> we had an article that one of the other comics posted on our chat board about the low pay that LA comics get. Can you kind of summarize the gist of it? Well, it was, um, I think it was like a series of interviews with, um, I guess you'd call them mid-level comics, and um, they, they were, oh, they were complaining, there, there was a there was an earlier article written about the super high pay you can potentially get as a, an L.A. comic, right, stand-up right. comedian, I think it was written by an agent, and then this was a follow-up interview with um, like mid-level stand-up comedians, and they were like, that's ridiculous. If I'm lucky, I might make 10 or $20 doing a 30-minute set. And then they also said a lot of the times when they organize a show, they actually end up paying money out of their own pockets. Um, so the idea that you can go to L.A. and make a living just as a stand-up comic is, is um, kind of ridiculous, it sounded like, from uh, what these guys were saying. Right, just pulled it up and it said, The Hollywood Reporter was basically claiming that a newer comic just breaking into the L.A. circuit can earn anywhere from $1,250 to $2,500 a week. And and I saw that too. I'm like, what? No, <laughs> yeah. is this on the metric system? Not the people that I knew. Yeah. And uh, New York was the same way. It's like you're lucky if you got it. Somebody would the bartender would buy you a drink. Sometimes yeah. you got free drinks, and sometimes you get you know ten twenty dollars, mm-hmm. or sometimes you get taxi fare. Twelve hundred fifty dollars, yeah. twenty five hundred a week. That's not. It's impossible. Not unless you're waiting tables at yeah. the same time. <laughs> so a lot of the people wrote in and said, you know, I've been doing comedy there for three years or something, and I've. Mm-hmm. I'm getting $20 a month. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I think you're right. I think the agent was trying to get more people so they could drive the wages down even further. (laughs) And another secret, Ari Shafir will talk about this sometimes, and Big J Uh Okerson, a lot of them have to be the the doorman at the club, collect the tickets, Mm -hmm. and they they don't get a cut from that. And, you know, they have to help... Ari Shafir has bust tables before. Right. So they can get more people in. You know, it's like you're, you're actually working. Club owners... Unlike in Japan, <laughs> in the States, they are very stingy. Yeah. <laughs> and vindictive. Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't even recognize a comedy club, Steve, if you would. <laughs> it's completely different from here in the Nagoya scene, where the you know the venue owners are trusting, yeah. and they're always encouraging you, right. and they never want to interfere with your set, like coming yeah. up with an idea, like, let's do... And nothing rot- disappears in April. No. <laughs> Rotating two-minute sets. And, do you understand the concept of opener, try stuff out, and closer? So basically, I'm going to have five openers and five closers. <laughs> in a 10-minute set? I don't think so, you know? <laughs> Remember what you didn't learn, John Gotti, at the Columbia <laughs> School of Comedy. That confuses people yeah. when you see an article like this. It says you can make hundreds of dollars. Now you've got more unfunny people trying, right? Yeah. Well, I, I remember, again, Joe Rogan made a funny comment on his show because he was talking about there was kind of like a bit of a golden age. Like, I think 
the mid 80s to maybe the mid 90s when there was like lots and lots of uh, comedy um, clubs opening up all over the United States and it sounded like a lot of them were uh, owned by the mob and then um, a lot of them went out of business and then new owners came in and Joe Rogan's like yeah we basically replaced the Italian mob with the Russian mob because yeah. most of the clubs now are owned by uh, the Russian mob apparently in, in the States when I was there in the 80s the scene it was there was just a lot of clubs in Long Island it was just unspoken they would say something like if you say you're going to show up you make sure you show up at that club <laughs> <laughs> so in the States Jay Leno was terrified of those guys yeah, yeah. and a lot of us were not taking it seriously so that's yeah. where my I told this on a different podcast but I had Sammy Gravano who I didn't know he, who he was oh, at the geez. time and it turned out that's who it was who was heckling me <laughs> uh, you know, if it were now I wouldn't say the stuff I said back then but yeah. I said you know he goes you told me when to laugh hey not funny <laughs> And I said, well, it's because you're talking over my punchline. And uh, he goes, well, you told me, you told me when I was your left. And I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of am because I'm the comic, right? It's my joke. I mean, so I'm, I'm actually the expert on when to laugh at that one. Yeah. And you ruined it. <laughs> Ray Romano, mm -hmm. he was terrified. Mm. Uh, a lot of these guys came from yeah. their neighborhoods, and he was terrified of these mob guys. You would know the mob places because they'd say something about, don't ask for a free drink. Mm. If you get a free drink, take it. But don't ask for a free drink. And... Sometimes they'd say, if you insult someone on the stage in the audience and then somebody buys you a drink, probably don't drink that. <laughs> Might be, the roofie, the roofie, the roofie's on fire. So, you know, that's why when I come over here and I have these venue owners who yeah. think they're going to intimidate you, you don't scare me at all. I'll burn this place down myself, all right? So, it's like a good fellow scene. It's like, that happened all the time. You play a couple of nights at a club. And then you'd go back and it's burnt down. One other thing we can talk about is the, what's that, the joke-stealing French guy, Gad El Male? Oh, Gad yeah. Gad El Male. Mm -hmm. uh, he's Jewish, uh, Moroccan, French guy. Mm -hmm. And I think Seinfeld even confronted him in France on TV. And he said, what's this about you? What is this? Who, who, who are these joke-stealers? Yeah. What is this about? What is this I hear about you stealing my joke? This is documented on YouTube. George Carlin, Richard mm -hmm. Pryor, Seinfeld, and a bunch of other comedians. This Gad El Male... Sometimes he, he did it in English, yeah, yeah. and sometimes he'll translate the joke into French, mm -hmm. but it's basically back-to-back -back 20 minutes of him stealing stuff, yeah. and why do you think he gets away with that? Uh, good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, Joe Rogan mentioned him as well, and of course Joe's famous for the confrontation with Carlo, Carlos Mencia at the comedy store, So, uh, and that pretty much ruined Mencia's career, so I don't know why that guy gets away with it. And, uh, and, and you know, other, other comedians don't. I guess because he's in France, he thinks nobody's going to ever see that. With YouTube and the Internet, that's just unrealistic. Mm. And that's one reason I haven't put a lot of stuff on YouTube, because I've seen, uh, back before the Louis C.K. controversy, he did one thing and he charged $5 for it on his website. Uh -huh. And you pay for his new set, it's like an hour, mm. and you pay $5 for brand new set. That's a great deal, $5 yeah. for that. And 12 hours after somebody bought that I saw it for free on YouTube yeah. and a lot of the millennials they just think that intellectual material and everything should be free yeah. no I have a day job and I'm spending my spare time actually trying to create something else right. that will propel me out of my horrible day job right. <laughs> and you're not going to post that for free on YouTube or yeah. steal my jokes hmm. I guess he thinks he can get away with it because he's in France or something yeah. and there's another it was a podcast called No Agenda and what they said was, listen carefully to like the State Department or senators or or politicians. When they go to Europe and they do an interview, uh -huh. they tell the truth. I mean, they actually <laughs> they actually tell you what they're doing. Because they're in Europe, they don't think it's going to get to the U.S. Oh, okay. In Italy, one time I was in Palermo, and I saw a comedian. He did it in Italian. It's something about it seemed very familiar. Uh -huh. And when I looked it up, it was a Paul Reiser routine. Mm. He also did a Larry Miller routine. Uh -huh. It was very similar to the uh, steps of getting drunk, the steps yeah. of... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was very similar. I'm yeah. like, what does this remind me of? <laughs> but because it's in a different language, it's kind of cloudy. Yeah. And technically, he didn't lift those words. Uh -huh. He translated them. <laughs> yeah. But it's the exact same bit. Well, in like, um, maybe it's that sort of stuff is more tolerated. I don't, it, you know, um, using somebody else's material because, like, you know, Joe Rogan again talked about one time where he got into an argument with Buddy Hackett, and at, at first he said he was really 
uh, angry about it, but then he got to thinking about it, and Buddy Hackett came out of the Catskills group of comedians, and he said back in those days, they would use each other's material all the time. So I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe in certain parts of Europe, um, using other comedians' material is just more accepted. I don't know. Uh, well, back in the Catskills, I, I did it a couple of times, and basically that was back before you had trademarks, like that's yeah. a Lenny Bruce joke or a George Carlin joke. Uh-huh. Milton Burrow was famous for yeah. stealing jokes. But basically, they just got lopped into a public domain Jewish jokes, basically. Yeah. Now, you, if you tell a Jewish joke, it's actually, there's no ownership of it, because it's been told by, mm-hmm. basically, you, you're going to come up with the same jokes if you have a, yeah. a Yiddish-speaking <laughs> mom or a Jewish mom. You're all going to come up to the same conclusions, yeah. you know. <laughs> how, how do you know when a fetus is completely mature, when it goes to law school, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But Milton Berle, he published a book that's like 5,000 jokes, and <laughs> most of those weren't his, but yeah. they're just so old that they're public domain. Well, as an SJW, you know, because I'm not Jewish, I'm not Yiddish, I'm pretty offended that I can't tell those jokes, and um, I think that's your your privilege there, Mark. Yeah. Well, I think we had, um, you did some funny bits before about appropriation. How about people wearing blue jeans? Those yeah, are, right. sorry, Levi Strauss, Levi yeah. Strauss, yeah. we're going to claim that one. All right. Anytime, are you a minor? <laughs> anytime you don't have cheese on meat, we're going to claim that, that's appropriation. Anytime you don't eat pork, that's yeah. appropriation. I think my joke was, you know, so you're making fire. Are, are you a Neanderthal? That's a cultural appropriation, isn't it? You know, Come Walking on. upright? Hey, we invented that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't walk upright. <laughs> and moving out of caves? No, no, no. We invented that. Yeah, yeah it gets ridiculous. Yeah. And we'll continue in another episode. This has been Mark Bailey with Steve Howard. We'll talk to you next time.